um, is basically to look at the world with fresh eyes and then think where is religion at. Who's practicing religion out there is not even aware of it. And, and that brought me to Burning Man a few years ago. Because I think Burning Man is a perfect example of, of a Mecca. And people who go there, they're preparing for 11 months a year. They're preparing for Hajj. Mm. So uh, I was there, and, and, and I was talking to people the last time I was there. And I was talking to people, especially on the Saturday night when the man burns. And that really is a very religious experience for most of them. And once you realize that that's what 70,000 people are doing, they're going into the desert practicing a religion, you can actually then start building a theory of that. What kind of religion is that? Where did the idea come from? What brings them there? What do they take with them back? How does it affect their lives, etc.? And that's where the whole idea of the synthesis movement comes into the picture. I, I'm not sure it was actually born at Burning Man, even if that's the mythology surrounding the idea. But the idea of synthesis is that we need a religion, but we should create a religion that we can actually believe in. And the word syntheos in Greek means exactly that. We create God. So it's the opposite idea of traditional religion where God exists first and then God creates us and then somehow God reveals himself to us. He's always a him, by the way. Um, in this mm -hmm. case, uh, the universe can create itself without any God whatsoever. We know that from physics already. So if the universe creates itself, we're part of that. Then we are free to create a God if a religion is what we want. So why don't we do it? Why don't we create God? That's the idea of synthesis. And I was looking at what kind of concepts, what kind of divinities, you know, if you're really straightforward, what kind of gods could we possibly believe in today without laughing our heads off? And coming from Sweden, or living here at least, a culture where 90% of the population are atheists. That's a very, very interesting question, because, you know, if you live in Sweden, people just laugh their heads off if you say the word God. And if you say religion, they're terribly uncomfortable. They never go to churches. And they look at America, where like 30% of the population believe in creationism and believe that Jesus is going to return. They look, they look at that with like, you know, horror and, and bewilderment. You know, it's so completely uncivilized, European people, that you can have a country <laughs> that size where 30% of the population go to church on Sunday. It's just like ridiculous. How can you possibly be that stupid? Well, they're terribly obese too, so maybe that's why. So anyway, um, how do you then create concepts that would be meaningful for people to actually pick up something like a Sunday service? And then you can discover several concepts that actually would work. The obvious one to start with is the universe itself. Because pantheistic religions have survived. We don't laugh at those things. And even the most ardent atheists will, will say that well, pantheism is a perfectly acceptable intellectual position. The idea that the universe is God. Because then you eliminate the whole question of where is God. He's obviously everywhere and you're part of it. So if you declare that the universe is God and it behaves like God, it certainly does. A very clever God too. Not a God that creates something separate from itself but creates itself. Why not? Then you have pantheos, the idea of pantheism. That's one God you can believe in. And, and the second divinity you would have is obviously the one that they think love, and that's Atheos, the God who does not exist. Now, that is a very, very clever God. It's the God of philosophers like Hegel, for example. Like God is strictly a concept, and he, when we think the concept of God, it's basically that we need a starting point for a worldview, and whatever that starting point is, it could be anything. You know, that's God. So it's a void. It's an empty space, you know, physically the universe comes out of something at least, and that void, whatever it is, is an interesting concept for a divinity. I mean, you and I, Vincent, we, we were also starting out as empty voids originally. We were a void when we were born. Uh, to be a person is basically to be an empty hole that you try to fill up with some kind of a content your whole life. And you do it every day. You know, every day you wake up in the morning, you feel like you don't exist, and you do things to fill up this empty void that is you. And this empty void really is who you are. So Athos is a very useful concept. It's the origin of the subject, whether it's God or whether it's you. And once you have those two and you start an oscillation between Athos and Pantheos, the, the, the world all and, and the void, then difference becomes the third concept. And that's very, very important in the world of metaphysics. I mean, 
metaphysics, metaphysicists from Nietzsche to the less abused it. And whole religions like Taoism in, in China, for example, have been built on the idea that difference is essence. Difference is where everything starts. And you know, yin and yang, that, that's a perfect example of that. Yin cannot exist without yang, yang not without yin, and actually, if they don't exist, nothing exists at all. So diff everything has to start with a multitude. Everything has to start with plurality. Physics works the same way these days. You know, physics is essentially a world of reducible multiplicities. Yeah. There are no singularities in physics whatsoever. We, we, we produce a singularities without perception, but there are no singularities in physics. Everything is a reducible multiplicity wherever you look in physics. And that is a very useful third god that we can actually believe in, and that's Entheos. Entheos, the god from within. Yeah. You have these three concepts. They're not that controversial. If you go to the world of metaphysics, I mean, if you go into Heidegger, I can give you a perfect example of a good metaphysicist today would be Robert Carrington, the American philosopher. And he's worked on his infinities. They're basically the same ideas. So that's not something that I invented. I just put these names on it. But the question then is, could we have a fourth one in there to complete mm -hmm. and have a pyramid, you know, the three at the bottom and then roof? And that would always be seen in those itself. So... If a fourth concept we could believe in is the God who does not exist yet, but the God who is to come, then that is the God of the future, the mm. God of utopia. Uh, the God of the dream that the world could be different from what it is, and that we, through technology and through clever conversations with each other and uh, believing that the world could be radically different from what it is and much better than what it is right now, that is the idea of utopia, which I believe we more than ever need to bring back. We live in a very dangerous age because we don't believe in utopia anymore. We always believed in utopia before. We don't anymore. And like Sava Shishika said, that is what makes our age specifically dangerous. But if you bring in synthesis in that, you have the complete setup. And you have a new religion. You have all the four concepts you need to understand the world fully. And, hey, you can build four different types of temples. There you go. Okay, and and I get the sense you're describing something that maybe exists as a formal kind of movement, but then also is this something that maybe describes what might be emerging in terms of human beings trying trying to do this in various ways already? Because you said you didn't sort of invent these ideas; they've kind of been out there. Do you see other sort of other folks kind of exploring this notion of of the God that exists oh, absolutely. in the future? Wow. I, I didn't invent the concept. They were invented socially, like everything today. It, it, it's a creative, participatory thing. And it mm. was on the synthesis fora that the concepts were developed, and people hang on to them and say, well, these are great concepts. We could all use all these four ones. We could use them. And then people invented, well, okay, maybe we could make that a calendar so we could have, like, Atheos. That would be midwinter, right? Oh, and, and, yeah. And summer. And Entheos would obviously be spring, and you would then have Synthios in the fall. And you could have the life-death circle. And you would also have four um, quadruples. You, you would have uh, four three-month periods. And they would always have their female names. They would be Athia, Enthia, Panthea, and Cynthia. And, you know, the phase, I didn't invent those things. These were invented in participatory cultures online by Synthias. And they were suddenly there. My job is not to invent the concepts themselves. My job is then to take those concepts, once they're popular and they work for people, and put meaning to them and explain them and go to study them and go to the depths of them and go through the history of metaphysics, the history of religions, the history of theology and find what can we find there. And obviously Buddhism is an enormous influence. Uh, Zoroastrianism too. Zoroastrianism is probably the most misunderstood idea ever. And I never converted to Buddhism. I, I converted to Zoroastrianism instead in 1992 because I thought Iranian philosophy was even more hilarious than Chinese and Indian philosophy. You know, if you travel to Asia, you have three great philosophical traditions. You have the Chinese philosophical schools, the Indian ones, and you have also the Iranian ones. And uh, Zoroaster is probably the first synthesis ever. And that was 3,700 years ago. And um, he turned his back on the idea that God is something we should be scared of and try to please, which is what all pagan divinities were concerned with. And he regarded the universe as divine, that out of the universe came difference. And out of difference came the mind. And he therefore constructed the religion based on the idea of aura, which in classic Iranian obviously means uh, being, and masta, which means sense. And out of the two uh, causes of being and sense, he built the whole religion of aura masta. That is Sorastrianism, which just like Buddhism is more of a philosophy and a lifestyle than it is a traditional religion.
Mm. So Zoroaster, Buddha definitely, Taoism. Unfortunately, not that much we got from the West. You know, the, the history of theology and religion in the West is embarrassingly weak. Uh, the Abrahamic faiths are not that interesting. Besides Sufism, there's very little there to use, to be honest, that we can believe in today. And probably that is why atheism has become a massive Western phenomenon, because um, the religions we had didn't really stand up to the test of time. And once we left feudalism and we moved into the whole capitalist, industrialist era, we all became literate and started reading books 300 years ago. We realized that actually the Bible was a really crappy book that should be thrown away. So, unfortunately, Christianity is not really in there. Besides the Holy Spirit, which of course is the internet, there's not that much that I've found useful in Christianity in my work. Okay, interesting. So, uh, I want to I wanna take, take a little bit of what you're saying because, you know, one one aspect of what I found interesting in your work is um, not just looking at you know the internet as God but also looking at how we how we how we could arrive at this point from um, the perspective that the individual is at the center of the universe you know the, the the notion that like I am the most important thing and you know you you can that, such a, that is such a prison who came? Descartes. It was fucking Descartes. That came up with it. <laughs> I think, therefore, I am the most well-known tweet in history, and the most ridiculous one ever. I mean, Descartes was obviously extremely autistic. You know, you would never have gone to a party with this guy. You would have been bored to death because the eye is just a void. What exists is a body. And, and and the body that we happen to call Vincent and the body we happen to call Alexander right now are two bodies that are full of potentialities and they can enjoy pleasures and they can enjoy life and they can do wonderful things. But I like to think of myself as a house with lots of different beings in it. I'm an individual, not an individual. So there are a lot of people living in this body. And in thinking about it, there are probably a lot of people living inside. Yeah, I mean, at least when I wake up in the morning, they're all arguing with each other and they're having conferences and what this body is going to do today. And you know, some of them are like, this body is going to move itself to a gym and get some physical exercise. And some of these other guys say that, well, this body is going to stay at home and read a book or write a book. And the third one says, well, I'm going to go to a swingers club and have loads of sex with all kinds of genders and anything that moves. You know, and these, there are lots of people inside of me. And once I started realizing that this was a better way to look at yourself as a human being, it became a lot more fun to live. Um, I think the individual caught on as an idea in the West 300 years ago because the guys who run the factories needed factory workers. That's how we got educated in the first place. The reason why Europe and America became literate and why we were schooled and sent to schools 150 years ago was because the factories needed factory workers. And to be able factory workers and to be able soldiers in the armies of the nation states, we needed to learn how to read and write. And once you started to learn how to read and write, and that became cheap, the idea of the individual caught on because you became this extremely efficient worker, very productive, by believing you were an individual. You also believed that your life was like a progress, like you would be better at being yourself, whatever that is. That's why people that read self-help books, I never understood that. Hmm. Uh, because I think I was actually perfectly fine when I was born. I don't think I improved. You know, like, I get older, hopefully slightly wiser, but that's just change. You know, I don't think I'm a better person than when I was 24. Um, um, and, and the individual is also, of course, because the individual can never be satisfied with being an individual. There's always something to improve that makes you constantly frustrated with who you are. There's always something to prove on you. If we use Freudian language, we would say that the superego completely took over from the ego and suddenly was in charge. And I think what I find tragic is the vast majority of Westerners, people who live in Europe and North America today, are obsessed with their superego and with its imperatives that you have to do this and you have to do this and you have to do this. Why? What for? I don't know. But it's like people enjoy being under this pressure of a superego because once they don't have God, they need to turn themselves into their own God. Once God was out there and you needed to do things to please God, and God's out of the picture. You 
reinstate God inside your mind as your super ego, trying to control the ego in the age, as Freud would say. Mm -hmm. And that's where we're stuck today. And I want to liberate people from this. I think they've ended up in a prison. I think the starting point is, is to look at yourself as a schizophrenic individual, like a body full of different people. Okay, it okay, that's interesting. It's a much more fascinating way of looking at what it means to be a human being. Yeah. I'm very careful with using the word self, self-realization. Well, what's that? I don't know. Okay, interesting. Realizing what? Mm. So... I just want to go into this a little more because this is kind of, in some ways, starts to intersect with the core of, of some of the contemplative Buddhist practices around investigating yes. the nature of self. Yes. And um, yeah. I think that, that, that kind of a perspective is a slightly different than what you're describing of we have these different voices within us. It's more that any, any, any phenomena, any subjective experience which arises is fundamentally fragile. It's fundamentally insubstantial and because of that we can't we can't actually find or construct some sort of solid reference point um, from that arising sense of sensory experience that that seems like a slightly different way of, of deconstructing or, or kind of de-emphasizing the sense that I am a self or I am an individual um, well I, th I think there I think there's something solid there you see this is really weird in the middle of this, I'm a realist I actually believe we have access to reality uh, and I think Immanuel Kant, although he was very interesting, he was wrong. I one of this, um, I belong to this new generation of philosophers like Clinton Melissa and Leon Nemochinsky in America right now, who, who hate correlationism so much they want to get rid of the whole we call the Kantian paradigm. Immanuel Kant was a genius. Immanuel Kant realized how hard it is for us to access reality outside of us. So he saw the world as I'm a subject, there's an object there, but I don't really know what's there. Mm. I create a phenomenon in my mind, but what really is there, the noumenal reality, is inaccessible to me. That is a very interesting idea. But I actually think what quantum physics has proved is that that's actually wrong. What Kant's mistake was the separation of subject and object. Because what quantum physics reveals is that the subject is not separated from the object, although we like to think so. The subject is always involved with the object. The phenomenon itself is the subject of its relationship, and the relationship is what's fundamental. There is no separate subject from the object. There is never any observer anywhere in physics who is separated from what he observes. That's yes. where Einstein was wrong and Niels Bohr was right. And the big difference between Einstein's world, and Einstein really was a Platonist, and Niels Bohr was Heraclitus. Niels Bohr was the guy who was right. And Niels Bohr, the conversa I work on this in, in the new book, is that the correspondence between Bohr and Einstein in the 1930s, the, the more it went on, the more frustrated Bohr was with Einstein, realized Einstein was this old guy who didn't get it. He didn't mm. get how reality really was. But once you understand that the original phenomenon is a subject object relationship, and that the world just consists of relations, we would never have reached the idea like the Higgs boson or the Higgs field that supplies substance to right. relations. We'd never reach that idea unless we'd first accepted the relationalist concept that the world consists primarily of relations and we only get our weight by being inside relation. What I'm doing, which is groundbreaking work in our new book, is that I'm basically saying that the internet is teaching us the same lesson. We like to think that the internet is an add-on in our lives. Hmm. Why don't we look at the internet as the realization where we should have been? And in that case, the internet is when we, for the first time, become really human. By getting a substance from a network that exists before us that connects 7 billion people on the planet. If you just train your mind to think that the internet is there first, and you and I are then connected to this internet, then we really get our substance from the internet. And that's how the social arena works. We become human beings by being supplied with the substance, with the weight, from social interaction. Yeah. That's how physics works. Why don't we take that metaphor to the social arena, to the world of psychology, and to the understanding of who we are? In that case, what is the self? Well, I think the self is basically, if you think of all these people that live inside of you, the self in all of this is just the empty void at the center that connects these people. Because when you try to describe who you are to yourself, if you, Vincent, if you would sit down with a piece of paper and a pen, that's very traditional, not even a computer, you sit down <laughs> with a piece of paper 
and you would write down what Vincent is, who Vincent is. You would write down maybe 50 different things. And it would always be the thing that the escapes description that would be Vincent. So you've written down 50 things. You say, no, no, none of these things are Vincent. Vincent is the 51st thing. Okay, and you write down the 50, 51st thing. You go, no, no, that's, that's not Vincent either. F Vincent is the 52nd thing. The reason why it works like that is because Vincent is what is within you that defies description, namely the void in you. Yes. Emptiness inside of you. That is the teaching from Buddhist philosophy, especially from, from, from Zen. Yes. And Zen has Iranian origin and not Indian origin, I should say that. And, and um, Why do you say I, that? That is, yeah. Why, why do you say thesis. that? Because Bodhidharma came from Iran and not from India. Mm. You don't find a single trace of any prince called Bodhidharma anywhere in India, and Indian history is pretty much researched. Bodhidharma was a trader from Sogdia, which was a province of Iran. And it was very common at the time, when he arrived in China, for Iranians to describe themselves as Indian to be more exotic. When you think of it, that's pretty logical. And there's also not a single Buddhist text ever found in China and Japan that wasn't translated Chinese and Japanese from Persian. Because it would come from India to Persia, we translate to Persian, then from Persia we'd come to China in Japan. So any form of Buddhism anyway in China or Japan would have been strongly influenced by Persian thinking. Sure. And once you travel to Iran and you go into the Zoroastrian temples and you realize that aesthetics is identical to Zen aesthetics in Japan, you realize this is the connection. Have you ever seen the Zen temple in India? Don't uh, think no, so. No, no way. Oh, there you go. Okay. It, 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 is, it was originally controversial theory about 20 years ago. It's becoming pretty well established among anthropologists. So, And I definitely, as a philosopher, would say that I, I, to me it's evident that Zen has Iranian roots, which is a very interesting because then Iran and China and Japan have something in common here that's very interesting. That was a parenthesis. I should go back to the issue. Yeah, please. <laughs> so the self, like, you, you, if you go to the world of psychoanalysis, and if you go to psychoanalysis, you should definitely go into Jacques Lacan, one of the two uh, most impressive minds of the 20th century. The other one is obviously Alfred North Whitehead. And Jacques Lacan said that the self is, is empty, the cogito is just empty. It's, it is one in us that is empty. And that's what we have to, we have to reach and understand that. But every other attribute we have to ourselves, we can then attribute to individual, to an identity that we can create and we're free to create. Yes. So I like to think of ourselves as multiple beings, but we have a center of this multiplicity and that center is the void at the center that connects all these things. If you think of it as a, as a clock with 12 hours, then you would make a circle in the middle and keep that empty. That's the you, that you are never allowed to fill with any content. Yes. That's the empty space. It's just a name, Vincent. It's just a name. And there's nothing there. And then you can take everything else as typical of you. For example, sexy guy with glasses. Okay. You, you can make that a guy. Maybe you have an anima within you. There's a girl within you. You like to party, you know. You give her some name. And you can then develop all these different personalities. And you can develop, say, up to 12 different ones. And they're all living within this house. Sure. The only thing that connects them is the empty void in the middle. This, this is a technique that's been used in... in in a field of psychoanalysis called schizoanalysis. It was invented by the anarchists in Paris in the 1970s. And the guy who invented it is Felix Guattari. And the world of psychoanalysis is a giant because he co-wrote several books with Gilles Deleuze, a huge philosopher in France and Europe and at the end of the 20th century. And, and uh, uh, Guattari he died about 20 years ago. But Guattari developed this method, and I've used it myself. And I find it incredibly creative and put people into this process of learning to see themselves as this wonderful house full of all these colorful creatures where the name they were born with and given by society is left as only an empty space that connects these, these characters. That I find to be a very truthful and creative way of looking at yourself. And you get rid of the super egos and all these things when you do it. Okay, interesting. So uh, maybe just just to respond to some of what you're saying and 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 see if I can uh, um, understand it better. In one sense, in one sense, I think what part of what you're describing that that seems to connect to my experience of of practicing exploring Buddhism is the sense of the the empty void that's at the center of things, or or you could say that that is nowhere. Um, it, it isn't it isn't existing in a particular place. Um, and it doesn't have any attributes, but you could say it's it's sort of everywhere and no and nowhere. 
Um, yeah. And, that, yeah. and, that, and, that, and then also that recognition of that, which isn't an experience or a thing, is inseparable from all of this stuff that's arising, all of these ideas and all of these experiences that you can't really separate. And Zen says, you know, form is empty, emptiness is form. You know, these are, are not, they're, they're inseparable dimensions of some sort of unified reality or experience. But then you're describing a, a kind of another dimension that I don't think the Buddhists talk about that much, which is these interrelationships of these different um, kind of selves or, or patterns of, of experience that seem to be um, kind of constantly coming up um, and, and in relationship, you know, internally and then also in relationship with everyone else's sort of house of selves. Um, that's really fascinating. That's another, I, I think in some ways, another well, dimension. You know, why, do you, why do you think Heidegger is popular in Japan? Once you get into the world of Hegel and Heidegger, the great Germans, you know, you realize well, Heidegger is popular in Japan is because he connects so well with Zen. Hmm. He, he's a huge philosopher in Japan. The Japanese love to read Heidegger, and I do too. What we need to add then is what Heidegger didn't have when he, write, when he wrote Simon Sight, for example, in the 1920s. Uh, being and was being in time in English. Okay, uh, he had no idea that quantum physics was going on. He was like the last generation of the philosophers who didn't know about relationalism, with the idea that in the physical reality, the relation is primary, and anything that exists is an irreducible multiplicity. That is very counterintuitive to us as human beings. We like to think of the world as things, objects, and we're one of these objects. And our friends are objects, and, and we are the object that thinks that we're the subject in relation to all these objects. That, that, is, that is what we intuitively do and have been doing for millions of years, obviously, and it's been a successful, Darwinianly, been a successful strategy, but it's not necessarily true. And what quantum physics re reveals, and then physics in general by now, reveals is that the, the relationship is, is not a thing, really. It's a field, and as a field, it is an irreducible multiplicity. It's an, an infinite number of things within a field, and they cannot be reduced to a smaller number, and certainly not to the number one. That is very counterintuitive, too, but that's actually how physics works. And what I do in my work now is that I, I take these guys, Heidegger, and I look at the Zen masters from Japan, and I just look at, okay, my job is to, to, to look at the knowledge we've actually created and, 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 and accumulated the last 100 years, especially from the world of physics, and try to incorporate that into our thinking and use it either metaphorically or take it literally and see what can we do with that. And then I discover that, well, Heidegger was right that the self is an empty thing and we need, and if we're going to work on ourselves, then we should work on ourselves towards a nothingness, towards a void, understanding us as a void. And to be honest about it, if philosophy is the art of learning how to die, then the art of learning how to die is the art of learning how you do not exist. And once you realize you don't really exist and you're an illusion, you'll be comfortable dying. The only people who really hate dying and are afraid of dying are the ones who think that there's something there. You know? <laughs> once you realize that there is nothing there, you're an illusion created by language. and you know, There's just a body. And there's a brain playing a mind fuck with you all the time, you know. And the, in the, in the mind creates the idea that there's a self there. And language and culture supports that. Your parents tell that you exist by yelling at you and saying, that you are not allowed to do that. That's how your parents teach you that you exist and you turn that you into an eye. And then you take it for granted there must be an eye there. Although when you think about it, you can't place that eye anywhere, except if you create a little guy watching a cinema watching a movie screen inside your head or something like that. The Cartesian theater, which is obviously a pathetic idea. There's nothing there. You realize that I must be an illusion. So, but what is interesting to add to this picture is that what do we do with the irreducible multiplicity? That is the body, for example. The phenomenon that you are walking around all the time. This body does exist. And it's very interesting when you, when you go to a, a psychiatric clinic and you meet people who go into psychosis, the, the first thing you do with somebody when they go into psychosis is that you take their hands and put their hands on their body, on the side of their body, and then you scream at them, the body exists. And they mm. go, yeah, the body exists. The body's a phenomenon. It's, it's, it's a solid entity. It's a field. What Maybe it's irreducible as what multiplicity than any other thing is, but there's a body there. And then they get a sense of an eye all of a sudden, connected to the body. 
and the, the body becomes a self-experience. Yes. And, and that is the acceptable form of looking at the self, is that the self is an empty void mentally, but speaking, but the body does exist, and this body is an amazing phenomenon, the human body is an amazing phenomenon, capable of loads of physical things, but also capable of a lot of wonderful mental and crazy things, and that's, that's what I'm interested in working on. Okay, interesting. Because this is, this is one of the, I don't know, one of the things I found interesting reading your work and looking at it is, um, and, and it relates to this um, sort of paradox in, in the contemplative tradition, which is that, you know, there is no solid self here. There is no kind of fixed entity. And at the same time, there is a personal narrative. There is a personal history. There is, you know, there, at the same time, there, there, is a, there is a sense of being someone and, and having to relate to that, of having to relate to our history and our body and, you know, and all the relations, you know. It's not like we can avoid that or completely abandon that to the void. You know, we can't just say, no, no, it, it truly doesn't exist completely. Um, so I, no, I want... of course, we're, we're protest every day. And, I mean, that's exactly why you get up in the morning. If you turn it around, that's exactly why you get up in the morning and try to fill your life with things. And even Jacques Lacan, no matter how clever he was, would say that not even I can escape that idea that there is something there. And that there has to be filled with something. It has to be filled with some kind of content. And why yeah. not? Why cannot an illusion be a positive and productive thing? If it yes. makes you happy, then what's the problem? That's exactly the idea of synthesis. It's like, you can say that but these gods do not exist. As what? If your concept of a god is an old man sitting above a cloud, smoking, being bored, looking at people, yeah, then god does not exist because he's not a couch potato, whatever he is, you know? And the, the, the thing is, that's just a really sad idea of a wonderful concept, which is the concept of God. One of my contemporary philosophers in Europe, Quentin Mabasso, is an absolutely mad Frenchman, even madder than an I or Slavish Ishnagar, you know. He's, he's absolutely mad and wonderful, because mad people come up with crazy ideas. And he's written this, he's only written one book so far, he's working on his second book, it takes forever, it never comes out. He's only written this one book called Après la finitude in France, after, after finitude. And he opens the book with a wonderful sentence. God is far too important a concept to leave to the religious. And what he wants to do is that he wants to create a new radical leftist philosophy. And he's just gone through the whole history of metaphysics and realized that any form of radical thinking ever had a utopia in it. And utopia is just another word for God. Why don't we just retake the word God, put God in the future, and they decide what kind of God we need or we need to create. And that obviously is the idea of utopia, a different world from what this one is, a more just world, according to Quentin. And I think that's a wonderful idea looking at this. It's like the reason we skipped God and threw God out, especially in atheistic cultures like Sweden, was that we, we couldn't grasp the idea that there'd be this couch potato God sitting on a cloud, which was a ridiculous idea. But just because we threw that God out doesn't mean we can't have other gods. And why can't the gods be illusions? If that's what we need. We ourselves are illusions, and once you truly comprehend and contemplate on the fact that you are an illusion, realize that, then that's not something to be bitter about. The only problem I can have with Buddhism is that I find it to be a basically negative attitude towards life, like you go towards extinction and that's the goal of everything. She's like, why? Um, yeah, sure we'll be extinct one day, but until we go extinct, why don't we have fun? So, you know, that's the more of a Zoroastrian approach to life. Zoroastrianism is much more positive than, than Buddhism. It's basically the same idea, but the, but the positive take, or what's called positive theology rather than negative theology. So rather than thrive on the idea that you want, you're going to be extinct, so you're going to sit there all day long and do your yoga and just hate yourself and hate everything until you go away, just like, why? You'd go away anyway. But before you go extinct, the idea of survival, the idea of living for as long as possible, having as much fun as possible, What's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that at all. And, you know, if our bodies are full of serotonin and oxytocin and all these wonderful things, then why don't we just enjoy it? That's what I'm looking at. Okay, great. And, you know, that, that sort of brings up this kind of reflection for me about um, creativity. You know, that one way of looking at the void is saying, oh, yeah, it's, everything's an illusion and everything's kind of bullshit, you know, from a certain perspective. Um, but then, from another perspective, like this void is constantly giving rise to these these new forms and these new ideas and these new. Yeah, questions. I love that. I love you know that's that's Hegel. That's Hegel. And, and you know what? Well, that, again, that's the problem of the temporality here. The problem with the God concept was that people put it in the past. Yeah. That was the idea. 
Why don't we put it in the future? And all of a sudden, it's a wonderful idea. It's the same thing with the void. Is if you, if you, if you, sometimes a Buddhist, you know, you work yourself towards the void, towards becoming this void, realizing this void, and yes. then be more truthful. But it's just like, why? We, I get that. I get that I don't exist. I get that. Despite my intuition, you know, there's nothing there. I can get that. I understand that. Why don't we then put the void in the beginning? And if you put the void in the beginning, then all of a sudden all creativity starts with the void. You wake up in the morning and you're totally motivated to live your life and to do your webcasts and podcasts and write your books and start your little internet startup and go to a party and dance on the dance floor and have sex with people and have children and live life and enjoy it. All of that starts with a sense of void or being a void. And actually emptiness is wonderful for creativity. And I, I, most of my friends are writers and artists and, and they all agree that, you know, they always want to separate themselves and go into the sense of non-being and being empty in their heads and suddenly they get the idea for the next book they're going to do or the next art exhibition they're going to do and work on and things like that. We always, uh, creativity starts with the void. That's why the void is a wonderful thing. We just need to put it at the beginning of every process rather than the end. Cool. I'm not as sophisticated as you can tell. <laughs> I don't believe I don't believe suffering is dominating the world. You know, I don't. Uh, there is a lot of suffering in the world, but the point is that we should relieve ourselves of it. Yeah. Get rid of yeah. it. Yeah. And I was going to say, you know, um, what you're saying is definitely true of of early Buddhism, but Buddhism itself has gone through, you know, some different um, shifts, and and tantric Buddhism, you know, which are some of the later forms of Indian Buddhism, we're definitely trying to to tear apart that idea that that we're just trying to escape, you know, this this suffering existence. You know that that actually, um, as as the guy I interviewed recently said, um, spaciousness and passion are are united, um, and and then the yeah. playfulness is is in some ways the core of, of that way of looking at spirituality. Oh, I lo I love the word play. A uh, friend of mine, American friend of mine, Mark Pesky, he lives in Australia now, uh, but he was a professor at the University of Southern California, and 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 uh, he wrote a book called The Playful World that came out like 30 years ago. It's one of these underrated books that people have forgotten about, but it really was a wonderful book. And he made, um, he wrote a whole philosophical work on the concept of play, and I think play is the deepest, most profound human activity, the most sacred of all. I think we're at our best when we play. And, and, and we enjoy life the most when we play. And creativity and play, to me, are, are, are correlated. And, and, and uh, just like I'm not that interested, it's great that there's science out there and the world is wonderful and, 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 and research is great and finding the truth about things, the whole idea of scientific endeavor. It's, it's a great thing to do. And, and, and the universe is so amazing anyway. There's, there's loads of things to find out. Hmm. But... At the other hand, uh, just creating stories and, and creating separate worlds and creating parallel worlds to the physical world we live in, that's what we do with art, with theater and everything. And that's most, it's even more wonderful, I think, even more amazing. So uh, play is, is, is a concept I, I'm happy to write about. And I, I think play has to be understood as not something that children do, but rather something incredibly profound, a sacred activity, I would even say. Mm. Beautiful. Beautifully put. And... Uh... Yeah, thanks for being here and, uh, and and playing with us and exploring this stuff. Uh, well, thanks I feel like for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you. And I, I feel like there's so much more. We didn't get a chance to get into you know some of the social and economic ramifications of of, of, of these thoughts and the the notocracy. But uh, you know, we definitely uh, would love to have you back on sometime to to. I'd love more. to be back on. I'd love to be back on. I love your show. I think Buddhist Geeks is an amazing project. It's great, great. Uh, I would love to come to the conference in Colorado in October, but I can't because I'm actually. Uh, I'm on Swedish Idol. I'm one of the jurors in Sweden. So, you know, American Idol, but sweet. And I'm the mean guy, of course, the guy telling the truth. So I have the Idol show on the Friday night. So I can go anywhere I like in the world from Saturday to Thursday, the whole fall, but I have to be in Sweden for the live TV show every Friday the whole fall. So I miss your conference because you put it on the weekend. All right. But well, I'm uh... Next time we'll 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 try and fig figure out how to work around Swedish Idol. <laughs> yeah, but the synthesis and book comes out in September. I'm I'm about to finish it now, and 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 it's gonna be it's a great it's a wonderful project. You can check out the synthesis movement online, and 
you know, the great thing with synthesis is that they believe that ideas should be free, so nobody owns it. It's there for everybody to have access to and to make it their own. And actually, the next project I'm planning after this new book comes out in September is that I want to do an anthology with some 10 or 12 young philosophers from around the world, and I want to give them the idea of synthesis and say, why don't you write your version of it? Mm. So we have a plurality of voices. Uh, so if anybody you guys out there watching this, then join the synthesis movement online. If you're interested in writing and you want to become a philosopher, then contact me on Facebook, and I see what I can do to support you. Great, great. And, and you'll just have to let people know that being 50 is, is an early age for being a philosopher, too. Exactly. <laughs> you know, I was in the music industry until last year. That's a youth basic. You're, you're an old, you know, the only thing you got left to do when you're 53 years old is be a record company executive and be an angry old man, and that's me. So, um, it, but, <laughs> yeah, I know Swedish House Mafia and Econa Pop, okay? But, um, you know, in the world of philosophy, you're young when you're 53. Kant debuted when he was 55. So I was 50 years old, and I debuted when I was 40. So, so I only just started. Great, great. Well, gr great to have you on the show again, Alexander, and um, um, thanks for taking the time. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Okay. Bye for now. Take care.